that, we'll send it out to Chicago and our own Wilfred Frost with a special guest. Will, take it away. Sarah, thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed, I'm joined by the chairman and CEO of JP Morgan Chase, Jamie Diamond. Jamie, good morning to you. Happy to be here, Will. Great, great to have you here, and uh, specifically in Chicago. You spent sort of seven years of your, your career here. Are you happy to be back? Yeah, I am. Chicago? I love Chicago. We moved here. I moved here to be chairman and CEO. The whole family moved. They went to school here. I think it's just a wonderful town. The people are wonderful. The restaurants are wonderful. You walked around last night. I hope you enjoyed it quite a bit. So. I, I did indeed. Yeah. A very lively atmosphere, and it's, it's great to be here. Let's talk about the specific reason why we are here. So, so as part of uh, J.P. Morgan's $350 million commitment to investing in skills development, right. you're investing half a million dollars today right. in the Brazier Foundation's robotics right. uh, training facility here. So yeah. why that investment here today, and why the broader $350 million commitment yeah. to skills? So I think it's absolutely critical that, that businesses work to create jobs and create a healthy environment. It's part of what a bank does, which is investing in companies or loans. So if you look back here, we're, this place is teaching kids as apprenticeships, electrical, robotic, these machines back here, and when they get out, they're going to have jobs earning forty-five to sixty-five thousand dollars. As you said, we spend three hundred fifty million around the world doing this mm -hmm. as part of a five or ten-year effort. I just think it's critical to do, and that we have to participate and you know make society better for people. And you've done a lot of that in Detroit and now in Chicago, yeah. and uh, still there seems to be, uh, in the way you frame this, a little bit of a gap. Yeah. Uh, you, you said in an op-ed in June that it's a moral and economic crisis that too many young people leave high school without clear pathways to a successful future. H whose fault is that? Is that the fault of the U.S. government? I don't want to blame any one person, but the, here's the fact. Half the kids in inner-city schools do not graduate. I mean, that is a disgrace. And we all should raise our hands and ring the alarm bell about that. And a lot of kids who do graduate, both high schools, uh, vocational schools, community colleges, they should have a livelihood when they get out. There are tons of jobs available, like robotics, coding, uh, uh, medical jobs, construction type jobs, aviation, automotive, where these kids get out and they, they have apprenticeships, they get trained, they get certified, they can go on to college afterwards if they want, mm -hmm. uh, and they're great jobs. And, you know, we as a society have to do a better job. America used to do this really well, and we don't anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we just got to get back to, to the habit of making sure the kids get out, not just learning about life, with livelihood. And so you're saying that America doesn't do enough of this today. And on your recent Q2 earnings call, you did speak about uh, Washington and, and the gridlock there. So much so, you said, quote, it's almost an embarrassment to be an American. What, what did you mean by well, that? What, what is all, embarrassing? I'm, first of all, I'm a very proud American. I know. Which, but, em, which embarrassing to me is our inability to get infrastructure done properly. We haven't built a major, major uh, airport hub in 20 years. last one was Denver. You know, uh, China's done... 75 in the last 10 years. I just mentioned education. We don't have competitive tax system here. You know, I travel around the world and you meet presidents and prime ministers. Everyone knows that they need a healthy business environment to create jobs and wages. Mm -hmm. And to have a healthy business environment, you need a competitive tax system. Our, our tax is becoming less competitive over the last 20 years. Everyone's improved theirs. We simply haven't. And I can go on and on. So what I think we should do is acknowledge America is the best country on the planet. I'm a complete patriot. There's nothing like this country. It is the shining, shining city on the hill. But we should acknowledge our problems and fix them. Because the, the lack of fixing them has actually hurt average Americans' jobs, wages, and caused a lot of the turmoil that we have in society today. So, so you mentioned tax reform there, and uh, lots of hope initially when, when Trump uh, was elected that that would get delivered. Do you think it does get delivered on during his first term in office? You know, I, I don't know. Look, I, I'm hope so. I hope so, and I'm still going to work towards that effort. It's just critical we do it. So I'm, I became the chairman of the BRT. That's 200 major companies. Business roundtable. Business yeah. roundtable. We, which are, these companies employ 15 million people. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of the capital expenditures. Indirectly, they probably create another 40 or 50 million jobs. And the point of that is to get competitive tax reform, skills initiatives, infrastructure, smart regulations, et cetera. So a lot of CEOs are getting, you know, we're going to get involved in trying to move the agenda forward. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful. And we speak to the people in Washington, you know, they say they're going to get together, have a Republican platform. We need one Republican tax return. And then the BRT is going to put his muscle behind it, try to get it. So the BRT just started for the first time in a long time doing advertising. Mm -hmm. We're going to have events in, I think, 50... 50 congressional districts to, to basically start educating people how important tax reform is for jobs and wages and businesses and small businesses. Mm -hmm. It's not about big corporations, it's about our country. And, and specifically on the, the tax reform issue, you're in the middle also at the moment of your company's annual bus tour. Right. Uh, and in a couple of days' time, you'll, you'll be uh, welcoming Mitch McConnell as part of that yeah. to discuss the importance of tax yeah. reform. Is that right? 
Well, I, he'll be joining us at something that we're doing in uh, Lexington or Louisville, something like that. So, uh, and the bus tour, you know, which we do every year, and we do other tours, you know, often by air, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we get to meet clients and customers and employees and show appreciation. We learn a lot, like on the bus between these cities, and we'll have been in Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Madison, Chicago, uh, Indianapolis. It's, it's, it's but, super time consuming for you to do all of this. Yeah. So, so is it worth it? Yeah, absolutely. It's four or five days. We learn a lot from our customers. We get to say thank you. We have appreciation events. We do town halls. Later on, we're doing a town hall in Soldiers Field for 2,500 people. But meanwhile, on the bus in between, we ask people, what can we do better? Mm -hmm. We ask our tellers, our branch managers, our investment advisors, and we get a long list of stuff. We take that list and we fix it. So we learn a lot. We learn, and, we, and we do the same thing with customers. You know, when you meet them, you, they tend to tell you what you're doing well and sometimes what you're not doing so well. And, and specifically when Mitch McConnell joins you, what will you be saying to him as, as, as your advice? Is the failure that f for seeing various bills get through Congress on, on him in the Senate or, or is it on the Trump administration? I'm not going to blame anyone. Everyone wants to get it done. And, or at least everyone in the Republican Party. And we don't quite know whether the Democrats want to do a tax mm -hmm. reform. But my major point is we should all get together and work as hard as we can to get it done. If we fail, we fail. But I'm going to give it my best shot because I think it's just critical to America. Let's talk about deregulation as well. We've seen the Treasury white paper on that. Were you encouraged of the contents of the, the yeah. financial so it's deregulation? It's very important for the public to know. No one, none of the major banks I know are talking about throwing out Dodd-Frank, going back to the good old times, or even going back to proprietary trading. This is about recalibrating the things which maybe didn't work so well. Thousands of rules to recalibrate capital liquidity that in a way that you can help America grow faster. I gave one example, which I wrote about in chairman's letter, where, where mortgage lending has been, so con has been so constrained by rules, regulations, and costs, et cetera, that it's unavailable to whole groups of people, like younger people, prior defaults, immigrants, first-time buyers, and it's not right. And that one thing may have held back growth by one and a half percent over a five or seven year period. So it really should be fixed. And so the regulators kind of know that, and they, they want to talk and get it done, but I, that Treasury report just lays out a lot of things they think should be looked at calibrated, nothing should increase the risk of a bank. What do you say to the critics of that white paper, the Treasury white paper, that say it's going to benefit your share price more than it, it benefits uh, the U.S. economy? I, I think people focus on the wrong thing. Do the right thing, and whether it benefits or doesn't benefit, my share price is not the issue. Mm -hmm. Do the right thing. Don't do the wrong thing so you can hurt my share price and hurt the American public at the same time. So the fact is, what is the right calibration? It's got nothing to do with J.P. Moore's share price. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a patriot before I'm in a, uh, the chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan. I think it's very important people focus what actually works, what doesn't work, and go back to that kind of construct. Your share price is a side point hitting uh, an all-time high today as yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, it's good. So congratulations on that. Well, uh, congratulations to the 250,000 people who worked hard for the last 10 years serving mm -hmm. You know, 50 million customer households, 60 countries, large corporations, and my hat's off to all of you from J.P. Morgan Chase. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, something that's already happened, even before we've got to deregulation, and that's the, the recent sort of CCAR uh, tests, where uh, you were approved to pay out over 100% of your earnings, 107%. Many analysts had thought you'd ask for more, like 80. You, you were bullish, you asked for more, and they approved it. Was that very encouraging for you? And, and next year, can you ask for, for, for much more? Can you pay out 130%? Yeah. So the most important, so first of all, we, we believe in stress testing, and, and uh, they've become very rigorous, which I think is a good thing. Uh, our preference is always to grow the company organically. So if you actually ask me, I'd rather use that to buy back stock or grow the company, I'd rather grow the company. And some people think that banks are buying, buying back stock or doing something like that and therefore not making loans. The fact is, loans and stuff like that are, are constrained by other things, mm -hmm. not right now by capital. So if I had a choice, and if things had been different five years ago, a lot of that capital would have been used making loans to help fund American society. And I think we'll go back to that at one point. So the goal is not to go to a bigger payout. I'd like to go to less of a payout and, and spend more time growing our company, financing the economy. I already mentioned there could be a trillion dollars more of mortgage loans. Mm -hmm. you know, and a portion of that would have been our bank. That would have fueled American growth. That's what we should be focusing on, so not, you know, not the payout in CCAR. And in terms of other uses of capital, what about acquisitions? Because I, for one, was surprised to see you involved in the bidding for WellPay, a UK-based uh, payments company. It was not a cheap one, $9 billion or, or, or something like that. I mean, in recent years, 
the big U.S. banks have been nowhere in terms yeah. of acquisitions. It was something you built a, a large part of your career on. In the years ahead, are you going to be able to go back to that now? Will you be looking to make acquisitions? Well, it's important to note uh, that we cannot buy a bank in the United States by law, so obviously we can't do that. And we didn't make a bid on WorldPay. They asked us to look at it, and we started looking at it, and then, uh, obviously they went to something else. One day there will be acquisitions. Again, my preference is organic, so we can go every business we're in around the world organically. There might be small acquisitions. If, if, if they happen, and that's not a promise, they are probably going to be more around technology, products and services, mm -hmm. payment systems. They are about anything to do with you could consider more traditional banking. And of course, you can't do any of that without regulatory approval. Mm -hmm. And you know the regulars will make it known to us what they would allow us to do and not allow us to do. At the depth of their troubles last September, when their share price was a lot lower, uh, did you did the thought cross your mind of, of trying to bid for Deutsche Bank, whether to help them out or help you out strategically? No. Never came across your mind. No, we wouldn't have been allowed to buy Deutsche Bank by our regulators. So I, but I, but, I, but I made the point publicly that, you know, Deutsche, and look, they recovered. I thought they were going to recover. Their stocks come back. They had some major problems. They were kind of man-made problems. Mm -hmm. They weren't a financial crisis. Uh, uh, and it wasn't a lot of capital you're talking about. So you know, what I was talking to regulators is that for a very little amount of capital, that will not be a problem. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to have a financial problem because the bank needs a little bit of capital. Um, in terms of markets at, at the moment, uh, are you concerned about the level of uh, bond markets? Uh, is there a bubble there? And, and when the Fed does start to normalize its balance sheet, is that going to cause problems for some people? Okay, when you say, am I concerned? I'm not concerned for JP Morgan because we'll be fine whatever the environment is. So I'm not that mm -hmm. concerned. I do think that bond prices, you know, spreads, bond, pr bond prices are high, spreads are low. I'm not going to call it a bubble, you know, but I wouldn't personally be buying a 10-year sovereign debt anywhere around the world because, you know, we went to QE 1, 2, and 3. Now we're reversing it. My view is the Fed is doing the right things, raising rates, you know, telling people they're going to start reducing the balance sheet. The likely outcome is that it'll be fine, mm -hmm. and particularly if the American economy is doing well. So if the Fed is doing these things in, in the face of a strong economy, I don't think it's going to be that disruptive. All I've ever pointed out is there's a chance it could be uh, disruptive. There's a prob possibility because we've never had the reversal of QE1, 2, or 3 before. Mm -hmm. And if you see the ECB doing it, the United States doing it, and maybe the environment is not the environment that people expect. Mm -hmm. People cannot predict the future. So my own view is you can't make something certain which is not certain, and there's a chance this will not go well. But that's, it, you know what, they'll figure it out. The Fed will respond appropriately, you know, if things are not going the way they say fit. When we talk about market dynamics, the last uh, two or three years uh, has been one of a strong rising dollar. The last right. two or three months, that's turned around in the opposite direction. What, what's your view on, on the dollar? And is that going to become uh, a sort of trend that we're stuck in now of a no. weaker dollar? You know, I hate to forecast things like currencies. And uh, the, the, the currencies move generally, you know, there's an expectation in the world. When the expectation changes, the currencies tend to move. And the expectations are usually around two things. I'm oversimplifying this, but two things. One is, is the country going faster, slower than people expected versus other mm -hmm. countries? And now we're a little bit slower because you've seen Europe pick up and Japan pick up. Mm -hmm. And our interest rate is going to go higher or lower, less than expectations that people thought. And they're lower than people thought. Mm -hmm. And those two things are probably driving a slightly lower dollar. If the American economy picks up, and rates go up faster than people think, the dollar will start to get strong again. When we consider the sort of main takeaways from Q2 earnings for the big banks, I'd say that, that one of them would be a sign that the gap is narrowing between you and, and some of your biggest rivals. Citi had a great quarter. Morgan Stanley's clearly sorted out its fixed income. Bank of America have had two or three good quarters now. Is that something that hurts you, the competition? No. I, listen, I'm a patriot. I want all my competitors to do well. I'd like to do better than they do. I'm going to work real hard to do that, but I think the recovery of the American financial system is a great thing. It's great for America. It should be applauded. And we've always expected people to become competitive again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you ever have a business meeting with me and you talk, talk about the competition, I always say there's competition, it's going to be good, and it's coming after your business. Whether it's Bank A, Bank B, Bank C, or Bank D, almost doesn't matter to me. So, uh, so I, we, we always expected that. In fact, I think we had, for, we had told people that we expect you know, that we, it'll get a little bit harder for us as other people get stronger. In terms of competition, clearly a lot. But, but we have so much good stuff coming, mm -hmm. you know, from electronic trading to online self-directed trading to, I mean, I can't even tell the people, but tons of stuff coming that I think will be really exciting that help us grow our business, doing a better job serving our clients. One of the new introductions in the last year was Chase Sapphire, uh, the, the credit card, and, and there's a lot of competition in that space. The take-up was very strong. We're coming up to a sort of year anniversary. Are you learning since that the profitability is going to be less good than you'd hoped? So, the, uh, first of all, the take-up, we sold in two weeks what we expected to do in a year. 
And for those of you who are listening, the accounting rules are that the marketing expense is expensed over a year. But of course, the benefit of the card, and it's a big marketing expense for Sapphire because of all the free stuff that goes there, the benefit comes over seven years. So in any new product, you're always looking at what's happening. You know, attrition rates, spending rates, lending rates, all that kind of thing. Great clientele. We don't exactly know yet. We're tracking it. We feel okay. You know, it could be better or worse than we thought, but it's been a great product and we've really enjoyed it. And, and it's been great with millennials, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, obviously as a bank, we have a lot of things to do with those clients in addition to their credit cards. So, mm -hmm. So, um, I want to move on and talk about uh, JP Morgan uh, itself and, and the future. Matt Zames, your, your CEO, left recently. Uh, when you consider that other fellow heir apparents in the past, Bill Winters, Mike Kavanagh, Jess Staley, have all left as well, what would you put that down to? Why have all of these uh, great minds left your company? Look, I'm, I am thrilled that those folks are all doing quite well, and I, and I applaud all the stuff they're doing. We have the best town in JP Morgan Chase I've ever seen. And so, you know, you, you've met some of the people, some of you out there have met uh, some of the people. We have huge success and great people for succession at the bank. And people are going to leave and do their own things. And, you know, that, that, you got to applaud that. And that's what happens to a company. And so um, we're in great shape. The, the, the issue of gender equality has uh, raised its uh, head in the workplace a lot recently, particularly uh, certain companies in Silicon Valley. W would you say that Wall Street is ahead of Silicon Valley on, on that as an issue? Yes. And uh, what I'm particularly proud to say is that 30% of my direct reports are women. I've been trying to get the press to write a story about this for years. 30% of our top 200 people are women. And they have unbelievable jobs, global jobs. They're in investment banking, M&A, uh, uh, equity capital markets, private banking, credit card, retail. We have a black woman who runs our retail division who's on this trip with us, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Thesunda Duckett. She was outstanding. I'm just so damn proud of what we've done in that. And, you know, most companies want to do a good job. So, um, so I think it's great. And what about on racial equality? Is there more that J.P. Morgan needs to do there? Yeah, the other, by the other very important thing about uh, equality, gender equality, racial equality, the, 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 the door to that is that people at a company feel trusted and respected and there's equal opportunity and you can speak to everyone. There's not favoritism. Mm -hmm. There's not groups against the people. There's not politics. If you don't get rid of that, you will, have, you will never have gender diversity. And uh, so uh, African-Americans, we're making a special effort. Uh, because we acknowledge that what we've done as well as almost any corporation out there, we haven't done J.P. Morgan well. Mm -hmm. So, like, we do a lot of things. We set up a separate group. We added schools to recruiting. We added retention. We added uh, trying to hire more senior uh, African-American talent. Uh, and it's starting to work. The numbers are getting better. And it's different. You know, we, should, we have to acknowledge the reason it's different is because it's a different history, a different background. You know, a lot of African Americans didn't grow up in the same neighborhoods as white people. They didn't grow up. They, you know, whites are maybe less, less comfortable with them. And so to make a special effort is a good thing. Because I do get asked very often about other people, why not us? Well, we're doing great with women. We're doing great with Asians. We're doing great with Hispanics. We've got to do better with African Americans. And we're going to. Um, I just want to touch a little bit on, on the London well issue, of course, an issue that costs your firm uh, billions of dollars and a lot of headlines uh, a few years back. In June, relatively recently, Bruno Ixil published his views in detail on the internet. And for the first time, he did uh, very clearly and specifically point the finger uh, at, at you. What, what's your response to, to that accusation? Well, let's, first of all, I, Bruno, in my personal view, was not the guy to blame. Okay, that he was doing what he was asked to do, it got too big, it got out of control. He had wanted, from what I understand from all this, he had wanted to do something about it. And look, companies make mistakes, okay? And, you know, there are good mistakes, there are bad mistakes, and we made a mistake. We confessed it right away, bad risk, bad controls, mm -hmm. uh, 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 et cetera. So, um, you know, it's, it's in the past. I'm, I'm not going to care less about the London one anymore. And, but I want to point out, but here's, a, here, here's, a, Bruno? Yes. here's a typical example of, of no customer got hurt. It was us. It embarrassed us. It hurt our company. Mm -hmm. No customer got hurt, and we fixed the problem. And so I agree. We, obviously, you make mistakes in life. And you know, how you deal with mistakes is often more important than whether you make them or not. You are going to make them. I don't know any business person out there, anyone in any size company who hasn't made a mistake of some sort. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and of course, when you make a mistake, you know, a lot of people come after you about that mistake, and you have to deal with that. So, um, I want to talk to you a little bit uh, about your family. I mean, you've spoken uh, at length today about your, your love for your employees, the, yeah. the impact they have made. Uh, in, in bringing you to where you are today in your career. What about specifically your family and their impact on your career? Would you be where you are today without uh, yeah. their support? So I think um, you know, I've always said family first, country second, mm -hmm. J.P. Morgan literally last. I mean, J.P. Morgan is the best I can do for my, my country and my family. I spend a lot of time with them. So my life is kind of binary, bi -bell, bar -bell. I spend a lot of time with the family, 
weekends. I have two granddaughters. I have three wonderful daughters, a wonderful wife, and, and a lot of time working. I like working. You know, you don't see me a lot of black ties and stuff like that. So those are the kind of two things I do. And of course, you know, without, you know, my parents died recently. You know, without your family and the support of your family and what you learn from them and in the good times and tough times, you may not have a great life. So mm -hmm. I always tell people at J.B. Morgan Chase, you got to take care of your friends, your family, your spirit, your mind, your body, your soul. Otherwise, you won't have a fulfilling life. Mm -hmm. And those are important. And I mean, the job is important, too, because you spend most of your time at the job. But those things are more important. You mentioned the tough times. What, what do you think the single toughest moment of your, your career was? You know, look, people expect me to say the London Whale, not even close. Uh, or, and I, though it was painful for the company, and I was quite worried about that because it, it hurts the people in the company. Mm -hmm. You know, we are flesh and blood. Uh, and some would say when I got fired by Sandy Weil, nope. I think the worst time, and it's kind of represented by when I called up the management team and my board of directors, um, both on Friday night and Saturday night, the weekend that Lehman was going bankrupt, and told them that you were going to have the worst, scariest week that you've ever seen in the financial markets or the financial system in the United States, and, uh, and that J.B. Moore Chase will do everything you can to help our country. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of things just to help the country, not for profit. Mm. Almost 10 years ago that was now. And we'll Almost. come back to that in just a moment. Before I come to the sort of conclusion, uh, you know, you said on the earnings call, uh, we've touched on part of that already, but you said on the earnings call you didn't think growth would get worse without Washington in action. It's just yep. that it could get better when Washington starts to, to start to pass those reforms we've talked about. What about since the earnings call? There's yep. been a, a lot of bumpiness in the Trump administration over the summer. Are you starting to get nervous about the outlook for economic growth under the Trump administration? But I, the, point, the real point is, is that the American economy is 150 million people go to work every day. It's businesses like this, it's everyone here. It may be shocking to people to understand that in spite of geopolitics sometimes, in spite of Washington, that, that resiliency and strength of that system is pretty good. Most people don't, don't go to work thinking about Washington. They go to work thinking about their kids and their family and their job and their customers and stuff like that. And so what I was saying is that America is going 2% in spite of some of that gridlock. Mm -hmm. I think if, if business and government collaborated more, and we got some of these things done, like infrastructure, tax, regulatory reform, we'd be growing faster. That's my main point about that. And, and Jamie, just to, to round things off, at the peak of the financial crisis, we've just heard your memories from that, you sent your friend and then Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson, uh, a note of support at a moment he was taking a lot of heat. It was a quotation from Teddy Roosevelt about criticism. It read this, it's not the critic who counts, but credit goes uh, to the man, man the who's ring. actually in the ring. In the arena, yeah. Whose face uh, is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly. If he fails, at least he fails whilst daring greatly. You've criticized Washington uh, recently. One day will you cease to be the critic of, uh, of politics and to step into the arena yourself? <laughs> no, I'm not stepping into the arena. And I'm not criticizing Washington. Okay, I'm criticizing us collectively. Mm -hmm. Collectively, the leadership of America hasn't done the things that would get us growing faster, jobs and wages. We spend a lot of time slinging things at each other, making every decision like it's binary. We don't do enough analysis and planning, which I think is a good thing to do. I, I'm just trying to do my share to get us working together. And so Hank Paulson, who did an unbelievable job in that crisis, and as you all know, and you've read since then about you know, how he suffered through it, you know, he did some great stuff for America. I still applaud his actions. Jamie? Even though, they, they, even though J.P. Moran paid a huge price for some of them <laughs> after the fact. Jamie, so, thank you very much for joining us uh, in, in the business news arena today. We, uh, we, we're very grateful. Jamie always Dimon. Always a pleasure. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Chairman and CEO of J.P. Moran Chase. Sarah, I'll send it back to you in the studio. All right, thank you, Wilfred Frost, out there in Chicago, and our thanks to Jamie Dimon as well, guys. Wide-ranging interview about his family, about his patriotism, about his thoughts on tax reform, which right. he's expecting. I, I, what stood out to me was his call on the bond market. He said, I'm not going to say it's in a bubble, but I wouldn't buy a 10-year sovereign debt anywhere in the world, sort of right. implying that that's where the high prices are. You know, overvalued. Jamie always is, has, a, has a tough job.